Good afternoon. My name is Tanya Kimber Jones, and I am the manager of Workforce Solutions with Chamberlain University and also a member of our Diversity and Inclusion Council. Our topic today is the brilliance of diversity and inclusion in the workplace. We are living in unprecedented times globally where diversity and inclusion is essential to innovation, creativity, and problem solving across all industries. We will share an in-depth discussion of the importance of diversity and inclusion in healthcare. We will take a look into healthcare institutions and how they could potentially reimagine and transform the lives that they're treating no matter what background or where they live. Today, we have joining us on our dynamic panel, Dr. Janelle Sokolowicz, who is the Dean of Academic Operations, Strategies, and Student Services at Chamberlain University. She is a registered professional nurse with two decades of nursing and one decade of nurse education. Dr. Sokolowicz is also the Dean of Chamberlain's inaugural Diversity and Inclusion Council, which is dedicated to supporting equitable and inclusive and inclusivity and empowering the university. We also have joining us Dr. Pamela Levescu. She is a professor within our Family Nurse Practitioner Program and also a member of the Chamberlain University Diversity and Inclusion Council. She has 39 years of nursing experience, 25 of which have been as a nurse practitioner and an educator. Her nurse practitioner work brought her aware, brought awareness to the healthcare issues facing gender minority. During her doctoral education, she conducted research on the healthcare issues, initially with a field of study that addressed receiving healthcare as a transgender professional. She is a passionate person about the issues of social justice that are facing those in the gender minority. Thank you both for joining us. Very excited to have you be a part of this discussion. So we'll just jump right in. Can you, Dr. Sokolowicz, start with us sharing a little bit about the impact on what diversity and inclusion efforts on healthcare makes? with the minority population. It's really interesting as we continue to evaluate healthcare, we still are at a place in which African American, Native American and Alaskan American women are three times more likely to die in childbirth than any other person. So that shows you that the disparities still exist and Increasing our knowledge and access to appropriate health services is the only way we're actually going to be able to save lives. Um, the racial disparities that plague our minority population are a national epidemic. And so they continue to be important as we continue to develop strategies to improve the health care of those worldwide. Mm -hmm. We have to continue to have discussions like this. Um, and so the impact is significant because people are dying because of our lack of of inclusivity. And so we have to continue to expand that inclusivity into the healthcare space, continue to, con to work and discuss and move it forward. Um, one way that I feel people can do that really quickly to really help move things forward is at the local health department level. Uh, your local health department works so hard with uh, your minority population, and that's the first place to start. Thank you. Dr. Pamela, would you have anything that you would like to add as it pertains to improving the delivery of care for that population? Well, I think it's important as we think about diversity and inclusion to um, reach out to the determinants of health, of course, mm -hmm. and to really include those pieces as we're looking at um, minority status in the delivery of health care. I think um, segueing into that is also being mindful about healthcare knowledge and healthcare background of the providers that we bring to the patient um, interaction and making sure that uh, all healthcare providers, nurses, nurse practitioners, physicians, PAs, et cetera, um, come with cultural awareness, congruence, and self-assessment regarding where their strengths are and where they need to um, perhaps um, change their practice, do some self-assessment, and look at the lens of patient care through the patient population. 
You know, you said something very powerful there when you said some when you talked about self-assessment. It's very important for us to be aware of who we are when we're engaging different types of people in order to effectively understand and then potentially deliver care. So I appreciate you outlining that for us. I want to take us down the road of what um, inclusivity and how it matters. Why does it matter in both healthcare and higher education? Um, Pamela, can you talk us a little bit about that and what that means? Um, so diversity and inclusion have become buzzwords in in the world these days. And um, you know, if we think back in time. They weren't as uh, utilized. We didn't have departments and um, commissions and committees on this. But as we've begun to become more aware of patient population and student populations, we know that we are diverse in many, many ways. And in that diversity, we see things differently. Um, our lens is different, how we grew up, um, the things that are important to us. So diversity is not just race, it's not just religion. It's a whole myriad of things that we really need to um, be open to. Um, so in talking about diversity and then in talking about inclusion, the inclusion piece of it, we can have a diverse population in higher education or a diverse population in a workplace, but if we don't make it safe for everybody to be included and, that, and have inclusivity, then voices are not heard. If it's not safe for people to bring who they are as authentic beings to whatever environment it is, then we won't have the engagement. And we know that workplace engagement and workplace commitment and turnover is really connected to diversity. It's also connected to people feeling safe and included in their work environment. And, and also making it safe for students to be who they are and bring their unique lens and unique knowledge to, to their experiences as well. You know, you highlighted the difference with diversity and inclusion. Janelle, as a international speaker who has been leading the charge of our council with diversity and inclusion, can you really delve a little bit deeper with us about the differences between the two? Um, you know, I think we have a diverse population in the healthcare environment in which we serve. Mm -hmm. Yet, as we think about um, nursing specifically, and I'll speak from that viewpoint, yeah. um, nursing specifically, we have 80% of our nursing faculty are white women. Um, we only have about 19% that are minority and 12% that are men. So we still have a lot of work to do. So again, healthcare is diverse. It will always be because everyone needs it and they're going to use it. However, how do we take the, uh, the largest employees, the largest number of employees in healthcare mm -hmm. um, and diversify them and create an inclusive learning space? So as Pam was talking about, uh, we have to start here. We have to start at education. We have to start at the university level. We have to begin to build processes and policies um, to create an inclusive, supportive, safe environment where faculty um, from all background begin to say, well, you know, I think nursing education is a great way to start, right? Mm -hmm. um, to transition from practice into education so that we can then support a more sustainable minority popu patient population. It's really full circle. That inclusivity, that safety that we build then translate to our students, which that becomes this diverse student population then that diverse student population becomes this diverse faculty population and that faculty population then helps to develop these diverse holistic engaging students that then care for this minority patient population and we know um, that the patient population they do better with nurses that look healthcare providers overall but nurses specifically that look and speak their same language and have their same cultural experiences so it's really important that as we continue to um, grow our minority population and it's continuing to grow, that we at the same time grow that nursing faculty and nursing student population. Creating that inclusive learning environment then creates that inclusive healthcare environment. So it all works together. 
And it's important that if we continue to do that, we can see the differences, right? We can see the difference in decrease in morbidity and mortality rate of our patients. And we know that, that's known. The Department of Health and Human Services has put a lot of work into educating um, the healthcare workforce about cultural inclusivity. They've actually created a standard of, of care for cultural and language um, appropriation. They have great training. They have great opportunity for us to engage. They know it's important. Study after study has been done. We then need to move the mark. So when we talk about the inclusivity, we have to also be honest about where we are. We haven't gotten there yet. Um, okay. We haven't built the framework yet, but we're working toward it. You know, research has strongly suggested that there are biases that are held in healthcare providers, um, and that impacts the quality of care that is delivered across healthcare, and it impacts access. Pamela, can you talk to us a little bit about how do providers prepare for that self-assessment when it pertains to those biases? Yes, um, this is a really good point, and it does dovetail into what Janelle was talking about in um, the, our diverse um, patient population and how important it is for us to really move the mark on what our outcomes um, are in terms of providing care to people of a variety of diverse backgrounds. And part of that is that we do have emotional intelligence. All of us have that. And healthcare providers have a great deal of emotional intelligence. And using some of that for self-assessment because we have unconscious bias and it's natural. It's natural for all of us to have that depending on how we're raised or our family of origin or any number of things. So it isn't something to be judged. There's um, no fault to be had. And I think part of it comes from beginning to kind of um, take some private time to begin some assessing of those unconscious biases and not making assumptions about things. Um, when I'm teaching students and I've taught across the span, one of the first things I think is really important is to not make assumptions about how somebody feels about something and their choices, their lifestyle and those types of things. So I think if we can also just stop for a minute and check ourselves about what our assumptions are about any particular individual, it's a good place to begin with. Um, there are um, different kinds of resources that are out there um, about that. and. There are online uh, tools for providers to do uh, bias self-assessment. So I encourage people to, to Google. Harvard's got a beautiful one on assessing self-help biases. So definitely that's something that research has illustrated. In particular, I'll say I'm more familiar with the transgender research, how um, provider bias has impacted outcomes uh, for the transgender individual and how harmful and hurtful it has been um, for them accessing quality care or accessing any care uh, has been um, has been very, very difficult. It's been detrimental to, to many people. You know, you touched on the fact that inclusivity, when you were, you know, going through your answer, you highlighted the transgender community and inclusivity is also incorporating the LGBTQ community. It's not limited to do, you know, engaging minority um, patients or minority potential healthcare providers. So being open and being understanding of all of those different things and understanding your biases in that realm is also important when you're thinking about diversity and inclusivity. You know, we want to definitely be inclusive of all people, not just, you know, a minority group based off race or, you know, ethnicity. So I really appreciate you highlighting that in your um, answer to us today. Janelle, did you have anything that you would like to add as it pertains to biases when it comes to delivery of care? I think, you know, as a healthcare provider, anyone listening will say, well, what is it I can do, right? What is it that I can actually do to make a difference? How do I create, do, how can I, as a nurse at the bedside, create policies to change um, our procedures or the way we handle our transgender uh, uh, patient population? The, the first thing you can do, again, as, as Pam talked about, is understand your bias. Um, that's great but then you have to do the next step, right? So you understand your bias, but you also then have to make a move. And what I find is that education is key. 
um, knowing even the terms, the understanding, moving past those terms to then making the difference. And a small thing that can be done for most anyone is take time to ask. Ask questions, seek clarity, be honest. Um, you know, when you are ha managing a patient, maybe you don't understand the culture, maybe you don't understand the background. I find oftentimes it's the fear of asking the question of what would you prefer me do? What would be best um, with your culture and your background? What would be best for me to do? You can ask those questions. People really will value that you recognize the difference because you don't pretend the difference isn't there. We celebrate the difference by acknowledging it and asking questions. So I think there's a great way for that healthcare provider to make a big difference because I would hate for you to listen to this and you hear all these huge things and you say, well, what does that mean to me mm -hmm. when I leave here? You know, when I'm done listening, what do, what do I do now? Mm -hmm. And I think taking the time to just ask, you know, taking your time. If you have a patient that you've never cared for that population, spend five minutes on Google like you would for anything else and just learn a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, it always, it can make the difference. It really can make the difference because if a person is comfortable um, with you, then you can learn more and you can help them bring them to wellness. And so it's really important as we advance as a population, we increase in our, um, in our massive amounts of patient population that speak another language, patient population that uh, may have a different sexual background and orientation than you, that you expand your lens. So part of that is knowledge, but the next is action. And so I think it's really important that we take an opportunity to just ask those questions. Janelle, if you don't, Tony, if it's okay, I'll jump in just a second. Because I, <laughs> um, I think Janelle's made some great points that really dovetail into what I was talking about, is about assumptions. And um, when we're with patients, sometimes we are embarrassed to say, geez, I don't know about that and um, to move past that place of feeling that judgment against oneself to say, uh, I'm not going to make an assumption because it could be harmful to the patient and to ask the question about um, all those things that, you're, that you don't know anything about that patient, you know, and, and that's okay to give yourself permission for that. And I think that that's really important. And um, I think the other part to this is patient advocacy in a different way. I teach population health and epidemiology, and we're, we're taking things up from an individual one-to-one -one level to a population health level, so 5,000 feet. So when we think about advocacy and we take it to a 5,000 foot level, we think about political activism, we think about knowing who your state reps are, who your state senators are, knowing what the laws are in your state, and understanding what advocacy might mean as a healthcare provider at, at that other level. The other part to that is the workplace, which is knowing what the policies are at your workplace and knowing um, what the environment looks like. So walk around where you work, look and see if it's an inclusive environment. You know, if, if all of the paintings look a particular way, chances are it's giving a, a subtle message to people. So that's another piece to that we might want to consider. That's a powerful statement, Pamela and Janelle. You know, knowledge is power. Knowledge mm -hmm. and, you know, taking the time to understand those healthcare disparities and really acknowledging people for who they are makes the difference in how care can potentially be, de be delivered, as well as, you know, education is being provided. I would also say that you all really touched on advocacy and yeah. the importance of advocating for the patient and advocating for the uh individual as they go forth. I really appreciate you sharing that. And thinking about that, you also highlighted linguistic, linguistics. And I really wanted to go down that pathway with the two of you. And either one of you can answer first. Um, you know, that's an exciting, that's an exciting part for me. When we yes. talk about, you know, we have 85% of our foreign born population. So those not born in the United States speak another language other than English at home. So it's 85%. So if they were not born here, they're not speaking um, English at home. And so when they come into a healthcare facility, if you've ever fallen, this is how I explain it to students when I teach them about caring for patients who are linguistically diverse. When you fall, whatever your home language is, is what you yell out in, right? So under distress, that's what you relate to. You immediately go back to the way you were when you were seven and fell and hit your knee and it hurts so bad. You go back to that. 
And that's what happens when that patient walks into the healthcare setting, or that's what happens to the nurse who is about to take NCLEX. So the nurse about to take NCLEX, they go and they, they've gone through nursing school. They were a phenomenal student. They go to take it. They're under such duress. They forget simple words that they knew in English because they go back to their home language. The same exact thing happens to uh, our patients as they enter the ER for the first time. Uh, maybe they enter, you know, they're just under duress. And so you have to remember that if we have this large population, what are you doing to service that population? It's, it's more than a, using a phone to translate exact. It's knowing who's in the room. It's knowing what family they want to be, uh, you know, with them what is appropriate to discuss with them and their family versus them alone. Uh, there's lots of other considerations that we really need to think about. And so when we think, think about inclusivity, that's one of the things I really love the Department of Health and Human Services did is they created those standards of practice for those linguistically diverse students, but they also have created, I think, cultural health. And it goes through an entire, it's free, it's online, it's, it's a free um, webinar series, and it goes through dealing with patients from all different backgrounds and cultures, but also considering those language barriers and how impactful they can be to the care of a patient. So I, I just think this part, you know, I'm, it's very close to my heart. Um, I, I care so much for all of our diverse populations, but I specifically want to make sure that patients who are linguistically diverse and students who are linguistically diverse have the access to services and support that they need to be successful. Um, it's important, it's imperative, and it's life-saving. And so it, it's just a great way for us as, as leaders and as educators um, to really think about that, right? So you have, and we had the largest boom of diverse uh, population that we've had in 40 years, in the last five years. In 40 years, we've had more diverse people, more uh, foreign born population increase here. So up to 40 million from 12, it was like 16 and a half million to up to 40 million. Um, just recently. So large amounts of, of patients and students that we need to service and we need to make sure they understand the services they're receiving. And we need to not discount their experience, abilities, background um, prior to coming to this country. And so it's, it's important and we need to empower them with the skills that they need to be able to manage healthcare and healthcare services because it can be very daunting for us who are native English speakers so I can't imagine if I was trying to navigate this um, as maybe in my second, second language or third language. So really important topic. Um, Tanya, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, Pam, did you want to add something to that? No, you know, I, as Janelle was talking about how important it is to have the linguistical um, attention that we need in providing care, that understanding that's critical, I started um, having a little flashback to a situation where I was in a, a healthcare environment and um, there was a non-English speaking person there and they were very much struggling to communicate and the person that was trying to help them um, was not able to speak their language and it this was in an open environment so it was like open in a waiting room kind of thing and how uncomfortable it was to witness because people um it was embarrassing for a lot of the, of the people there so we we need to think about how we're saying what we're saying where we're saying it mm -hmm. and um provide privacy and to be aware of all of those issues that go go along with that it's very important you, you know you both paint a very awesome picture and it actually made me think about how I would feel if I was that person that was coming into an organization or into the healthcare environment where English wasn't the first language and people were trying to communicate with me and you automatically do go back to that time in your life where you're thinking about I'm hurt and instantly I think of my mom. I'm like, I wanna call my mom's name. And a lot of times that, that struggle is what people go through when they're trying to articulate what's going through or going mm -hmm. on with them when um, people can't identify with them because mm -hmm. of the language barrier. So I think you've given us all something really to think about when you think about language barriers and you think about uh, gender and ethnicity being a, a barrier that patients may go through or students may go through when they are in the healthcare environment. 
Mm-hmm. So that being said, and you know, I'm going to wrap it up so we can open it up for potential questions in the community. I wanted to ask you all, um, in your opinion, why in 2020 is discussing diversity and inclusion in healthcare um, so important when everyone is currently, you know, heightened and aware about diversity and inclusion in the healthcare setting? Why is it more important now than ever? Well, I'll just dive in and um, Janelle, you know, interrupt me when, when you when you have a spot. I just think that Janelle began by talking about the data and the data just shows how we're growing and growing and growing in our diversity. This isn't an, a, a maybe need to do. This isn't a nice to do. This is a need to do. This is a need to do because, um, you know, we're the U.S. and we know what's going on and we see the things in the news and we can't avoid those and we see the data that's coming out of um, outcomes and we see what happens to healthcare outcomes when we aren't appropriately preparing um, for people as they should be cared for with with an ethics and a morality and a social justice lens that are it's imperative um, and it's imperative that we have that it's it's not a gift we give to people it's a right um, and it is for our students as well yeah, as a as a woman of color, I it, this is life or death. Um, we have we are at a choice in which we have we are at a point in which we have um, the ability to impact so many positively and to save lives. And so, the idea that my mom um, in 1960 integrated the libraries in Petersburg, and that now in 2020, as I chair a diversity inclusion council and really think through a strategy for diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, We have to get to a point in which we are acknowledging, empowering, supporting, protecting um, every single person and valuing their experience, their background, all that they've gone through to just be a human. And so it is important um, and we're at a pivotal point in life uh, to do that. And in 2020, we have had many things that we've tackled and battled and brought forth. And now it's time for the baby to be born. Okay. So we are labored and labored and labored. And now it's time to see this beautiful being created, which is equality and equity, um, living through the lens of diversity, equity, inclusion. So it is, it is important uh, for us and it is the time and the time is now and the time is right. Um, We can start here in the nursing space, and I hope to be part of that solution uh, to really start to grow us as a population, uh, to grow um, all types of diverse leaders here at Chamberlain. Uh, We are uh, really supportive of growing our diverse leaders, and we'll even build more strategies toward growing more diverse leaders as we advance our population. And so it's exciting, Um, it's overwhelming, (laughs) Uh, but it's time. And so I think as we as we embark on this next decade, uh, that we will see it happen faster. We will see it happen um, thoroughly and, and we'll see a great, great result from it. But it, it's time to birth the baby. Uh, that's where we're at. I love that. I love that analogy. It <laughs> is time to birth the baby. And, you know, you all have given us some strong takeaways to take Forth as we consider our impl- what we do and how we take charge and the way we lead from the front as it pertains to diversity and inclusion. I know for myself, I took away knowledge because knowledge definitely is in power. I, I took away being active and being an advocate for our patients and then being that person who's ready to support the birth of the baby, <laughs> you know? It's time for us to make, it's time for us to take action and lead from the front. So I'm really excited and I wanna open it up to our viewing audience to see if they have any questions for our dynamic panelists today. Okay, so we got a few comments right now. There, um, the comments that I'm seeing is that 
me, this conversation is meaningful dialogue. We got that from Christy. Meaningful dialogue and a necessary conversation within the workplace. Uh, amazing interaction. People really are enjoying the conversation and the dialogue between the two of you. And they are appreciative of the con such conversation that is necessary today in the workplace. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm getting a few others. <laughs> no questions quite yet. Um, great point on linguistics. You know, someone you know yes. identify yeah. just yeah. how large our our yeah. linguistic population is. Uh, you know, yeah. when I um and and again another thing that's really cool that I thought was uh, amazing um, in 2014. I want to make sure I say it correct. I think it was 2014. We had the most minority babies born than the past 30 years. Mm. So we we are we are just growing. Um, mm. I serve on as I, as well as what I do for Chamberlain is my my day job, right? Um, I serve on the American Association of Colleges of Nursing's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion group, and we're working toward building um, some standards for diversity and evaluation of diversity criteria. Um, building a metric for evaluation of, of diversity criteria for colleges of nursing. And, and part of that work is we'll be launching a symposium soon. So I invite everyone to, to look into that, um, to learn more about how we're going to advance this work. But um, really thinking about just the diverse landscape that we're serving is huge. It, it, it baffles you, you know, as you read the literature and I'm in the literature all the time, um, more and more we're learning and, and more and more we're going to have to do. Um, I see there was a question. What do you think about the most important first step yeah. in the workplace? If you could be the one to birth the baby, <laughs> um, you know, I, I, for me, um, I'm about action. So, you know, for me, giving you all a little bit of my story at Chamberlain, um, I started our diversity work with what I knew. And, and this is to be honest, I'm very transparent. What I knew would be accepted easily. And I tell people, we call it the low hanging fruit. You first pick the low hanging fruit and, that, and it has to be um, because you wanna get things done. And so for me, I worked first with the students. What could I do to help our linguistically diverse students? So we built some education. Um, we worked with, a, I got a task force of people who volunteered. So we got the people who really wanna be there to help. And that's another thing, identify your person, identify the other person that cares about this content and work together as a team. Uh, Pam and I have been a team. Uh, she's been on a number of different projects, not just this one, not just the council, other projects. Find that person and pick pick one thing to start with. I always tell the students that when we when you leave things like this, you think of 20 things you want to do. I want to go do every education. I want to go to every symposium. I want to go to every conference. Pick one focus initially. So whether that's joining your local legislation um, that is, you can do that. We always need people in legislation that are willing to work. So if that's the first thing you want to do, do that. Do the first thing. In the workplace specifically is to bring it up. If you recognize that you have no leaders that are diverse, mention that. Yeah. If you recognize that um, you don't have pronouns, uh, pronouns, there, there isn't a, a place for pronouns or people don't recognize pronouns say something about it. Uh, the first thing to do is just to speak up. Uh, most of the time, you may not be the person that writes the policy or the procedure, but you are the person that has a voice. And whether that voice be in an email, whether that voice be on a, um, you know, maybe it's a survey that went around, write it in the comments. People are paying attention. It's okay to ruffle a little feathers. Uh, that can really make a big change. You have to bring it forward. You have to bring it forward. You have to be willing to be bold. Um, and I know it's uncomfortable. So if you have to put it in an anonymous email, do that. If you have to send it in an open letter to leaders, do that. But but use your voice. Um, that's your, really your first your first step. In my I'm going to segue into what Janelle said about the workplace yeah. because I think it's an important concept to talk about. And it's an it's an important thing to talk about. Um, and I think observe your workplace. See how people are being spoken to. See how people are being heard or not heard or shut down and look and see around you. Pause and be mindful and observe for a while and just look and see how how things are playing out. And then and then make a move. Stand up, be a champion for that person who you feel 
isn't being heard or recognized or there are microaggressions going on. Be familiar with what that looks like wherever you are, whether those microaggressions are in your workplace, whether they are at, um, at your place of employment, um, at school or whatever, wherever you are, you're in a restaurant. Those microaggressions against people of, we want to say, you know, race, minority, sexual and gender, whatever it might be, happen. And we have to notice them and speak up about them. I think that that's really, really critical, um, that advocacy and looking at that. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That's so amazing. And I am so grateful and appreciative of you all bringing that forward in our conversation. Again, key takeaways are speak up. You have a voice. Utilize your voice, especially when you have an opportunity in your employee engagement and enablement surveys. Be that advocate for your patients and your students and your colleagues. And knowledge is power. I thank you both for really taking the time today and joining us. I look forward to future conversations with the two of you on this timely and very important topic. Have a great afternoon. And thank you all for joining us today in our mastermind section. Um, stay tuned for next week where we will be discussing human trafficking and healthcare. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.